Coming into the last half of the third inning is going to be Eddie Stanky leading off for the Boston Braves. The Indians lead 1 nothing. It'll be Eddie Stanky to be followed by Bill Boisel, and then we'll go to the top of the order and pick up Tommy Holmes. Eddie bats him right handed. He's had four hits and 13 times at bat in the series. The outfield around toward left. Not too extreme, however, and not too deep. Bob Lemon delivers. Fastball, it's high. Ball one. Stanky sort of a half, half bluff to bunt and had a look at Kenny Keltner. Keltner's laying back fairly deep. Of course, Stanky may not be laying one down because that ankle injury slowed him up tremendously. Here's your pitch, and it's low inside for ball two. <coughs> two balls, no strikes. Lemon getting that sign from Hegan. The right-handers into the windup. In comes the pitch. And it's over that outside corner. Belt high for a call strike, and the count is two and one. One to nothing, favor Cleveland. We're in the last half of the third inning. Lemon taking lots of time. Joe Gordon stationed deep and over near second base. Now the pitch. Stanky takes, and it's over the inside corner, just below the shoulders for call strike two. So he got a 2-2 count on it, Eddie. Eddie didn't like the decision on that. Reaches down, snatches a little dirt off the ground. Meantime, delivers himself of a choice word or two. Taps his uh, spikes with the bat. Now he moves into hitting position once more. He's ready. Actually, his right or back foot is out of the bounds of the batter's box, but they don't pay too much attention to it. Now the pitch, swung on and fouled back to the screen. Count remains 2-2. Every once in a while, a catcher will uh, call to the umpire's attention the fact that Stanky's hind foot is outside the back restraining line of the batter's box, which, strictly speaking, is against the rules. The catcher will do that once in a while to try and rattle Eddie. But they're not saying anything about it right now, but from our perch up here with the line still not yet obliterated, you can uh, see it's way out of there. Two balls, two strikes. Stanky slightly bent at the knees. Takes a high fastball for ball three. So he got a full count on Eddie, three and two. Leading off for the Braves in the last half of the third inning. One to nothing, favor of Cleveland. Doubles in the top of the third inning by Mitchell and Boudreaux giving the engines a run. Here's your pitch and it's inside, ball four. Eddie Stanky works his specialty, that of getting a base on balls, and he's on first base. That brings to the plate Bill Boisel. Boisel is not too much of a hitter. Matter of fact, I think his batting average matches the number on his uniform, 96, in his regular season batting average. In his looking for the bunt, the pitch is taken inside, however, ball one. The base on balls that Eddie Stanky just received is the fifth that he's worked Cleveland pitching for during the course of this series. One to nothing, favored Cleveland. Last of the third. Engines looking for the bunt with Keltner charging from third, Robinson from first, Boudreau to second, and Gordon to first. The pitch, and it's bunted foul off to the right of the plate for a strike. One and one. One ball, one strike. The tempo of the game hasn't been too rapid. It's been a case of the Braves trying to play it for all it's worth, realizing that they cannot make a slip whatsoever, else the World Series will be over. The Indians, on the other hand, want to maintain the edge they do have of a 3-2 edge in games played and would like to clinch the fall classic. Now the delivery to Boisel is bunted down the first baseline. Hegan up for the ball, plays it to first base to Gordon, covering for the out, which moves Stanky to second. Boisel sacrifices and is out. Hegan to Gordon covered first. The Boisel did all that Billy Southworth expected of him to lay down the sacrifice bunt. That brings the plate Tommy Holmes. Tommy bounced out in the first inning to Bobby Lemon, a habit that uh, Lemon has induced Holmes to get into since he's been pitching in this World Series. Now the delivery to Tommy. Swung on line to the hole between first and fourth. Holds up, however, as Mitchell fires his throw into the plate, cut off by Keltner. 
And Stanky is held at third. Tommy Holmes lined a single to left, but Eddie Stanky could not go any further than third base. Stanky, after having broken his ankle this summer, nursed it back to health in time to get back into the World Series. But it reduced his speed tremendously. That is to say, or to put it uh, perhaps more properly, it slowed him up a great deal more. So now you have runners on first and third, one out, and Al Dark, the batter, with a score, one to nothing, favor of Cleveland. Bob Lemon pitches to Dark. Curveball is low, ball one. One ball, no strikes. Threat of rain in the air. Activity in the Cleveland bullpen, which is located behind a signboard in deep right center. We can't quite identify the warm-up hurler. Now the pitch, and it's a curve outside, ball two. We believe it to be Steve Gromek. Steve Gromek throwing the bullpen for Cleveland. Bob Lemon, who beat the Braves 4-1 in the second game of the World Series. In a little difficulty right now. Indians lead 1-0, last to third. Stanky on third. Holmes on first, one out. Stretch the pitch. Al Dark takes low, ball three. Ed Kleiman also throwing the both ends for Cleveland. Kleiman and Gromek. Lemon gets a sign from Hegan. Stanky on third, Holmes on first, one away. And the pitch in there for a call strike. And the count is three and one on Alvin Dart. Three balls, one strike. Outfield, round toward left, not too deep in right. Indians infield in double play position. Here's the pitch. Swung on, the ground ball hit back to Lemon. Lemon to Boudreaux for one, back to Robinson, double play. Al Dark hits into the double play. Lemon to Boudreaux to Robinson. And that's all for the Braves' threat in the last half of the third inning. No runs, one hit, no Indian errors, and one man left on for Boston. And thus you had the spectacle, if we might use that word, of a base hit with a runner on second base, but yet advancing him only to third. And thus the Braves were unable to score. And at the end of three innings of play, the Indians lead one to nothing. Your three inning totals, Cleveland, one run. Four hits, no errors, four men left on. And the Boston Braves, no runs, three hits, no errors, and two men left on base. Thus we're ready now to move into the top half of the fourth inning. Incidentally, that was the fourth double play that the Cleveland Indians have come up with behind Bob Lemon in the course of this World Series. The Indians have come up with seven double plays overall in this World Series, and a pitcher will always tell you that's the greatest play in baseball. Runners on those bases for the boys to come up with that double play and get them out of those jams. All right, Thurman Tucker leads off for Cleveland, top of the fourth. Left-hand batter takes low, ball one. Tucker fouled out in the second inning to Bob Elliott, making his first appearance in the series. Although he's a left-hand hitter, they don't play him to pull too sharply. Takes a delivery into the dirt. Ball two. You have to watch Tucker because he's a very fast man. He likes to lay him down that third baseline and beat him out. Bob Elliott, of course, is aware of that. He's laying in close at third. Cleveland Indians getting on Bill Voizel, a good-natured bench jockeying. Bill looks back over on... Uh, into the Cleveland dugout. Now he's into the wind-up pitches. Tucker swings and fouls it off to the right of the plate. Two and one the count. Of course, Bill knows most of the boys pretty well. When a member of the New York Giants, Boisel used to pitch against the Indians in spring training. Now the delivery. Swung on to bounding ball, hit out towards second base. Thank you to his right up with it. Over to first in time for the out. Tucker grounding out Stanky to Torgerson. Eddie handling himself very loosely and easily as he fielded that ball within one stride of second base as you look out onto the field. Now Eddie Robinson steps up, a left-hand batter. Lined out to Stanky in the second inning. Outfield goes back a little deep, almost straight away. Bill Boisel throws, pitch is swung on. 
fouled off out of play back at third. Strike one, as Robinson didn't get around that ball fast enough and hit it on the handle of the bat and fouled it off out of play. One to nothing, favored Cleveland. Top half of the fourth inning of the sixth game of the 1948 World Series. For the Indians, one game up, three to two. Now the pitch. Very high fastball. Count even up at one and one. You've got Marv Brickard in left field, Mike uh, McCormick in center, Tommy Holmes in right. Bob Elliott at third, Al Dark short, Ed Stanky second, Earl Torgerson first, Bill Salkeld catching, Bill Boisel pitching to Eddie Robinson, left-hand batter who swings and lines one out to right field, coming past is Tommy Holmes, and he makes the catch for the out. <laughs> Robinson lines to Holmes in right field. Tommy had to come in for that ball because it was sinking and might have dropped for the base hit, but for his quick burst of speed and his quick reaction in moving in on that ball. Now with two down, you got Jimmy Hegan stepping up. Jim single to left field in the second inning. Bill Boisel, anxious to work, delivers. Hegan looks at a fastball that's in there for a call strike. Jim Hegan is on his way to becoming one of the all-time uh, great catchers, in most folks' estimation, in the American League. Now the delivery. Swung on and missed strike two as he made Hegan go after a bad ball. A low inside fastball. Two strikes to count on the Indian catcher. One to nothing, favorite Cleveland, top of the fourth. Boisel throws, sidearm fastball that high outside. One and two. That might have been a sidearm curve instead of a sidearm fastball. In any event, it was outside and high. So the count is one and two. Boisel throws, pitch is swung on him, missed. Strike three. And I mean, that big bill just reared back and fired that one. No runs, no hits, no errors, nobody left on. And at the end of three and a half innings, the score, Cleveland won, Boston nothing. Years ago, when the first World Series was played, nobody dreamed that someday this great baseball classic would be broadcast everywhere as it is today. Neither did anybody dream of a razor as advanced in principle as the ultra-modern Gillette Super Speed Razor. This one-piece razor has a notched positioning bar for use with the Gillette Blue Blade Dispenser. You just hook on a blade and it drops in place presto. Then twist the handle and you're ready for the smoothest, most refreshing shave you ever had. There's nothing to fit together, nothing to jam or clog. To clean, simply loosen the razor, rinse and shake. Why not enjoy extra shaving comfort and convenience? Ask for the improved Gillette Super Speed Razor with 10 blade Gillette Dispensers. A big $1.50 value for only a dollar. Last half of the fourth inning. The Boston Braves will be sending up Earl Torgerson, Bob Elliott, and Marv Rickard. You know, incidentally, we had a wire, Jim Britt and I had wires uh, asking us if a player was ever put out of a World Series game for arguing with an umpire, a thing that stemmed from Lou Boudreau arguing uh, with Bill Stewart the other day. In answer to that, we can tell you that Frank Chance Cub first baseman and manager in 1910 was put out of a World Series game, and Heine Manush with the Washington Senators, the left fielder, was put out of a World Series game in 1933 by the umpires, but uh, Joe Medrick was put out by the baseball commission of the 34 World Series. There's a pitch that's outside for ball one. One ball, no strikes. One to nothing, favorite Cleveland, last half of the fourth inning. Earl Torgerson, left-hand batter. Bob Lemon, the right-hander of the windup, here's the pitch, and it's in there for a call strike. Count even up at one and one. The outfield playing uh, Torgerson just stepped toward right and center and right, almost straight away and left. And that Tucker's mighty deep in center. He's way back out there. Now the pitch. And it's just outside for ball two, two and one. Third baseman Kenny Keltner laying about 12 feet off the third baseline. Lou Boudreau is in about four or five steps at short over near second. Joe Gordon on the edge of the outfield grass, shading second just a little bit more than first. With Eddie Robinson, the first baseman, deep and about five feet off the first baseline. Bob Lemon into the windup. In comes the pitch. Torgerson swings and lifts a fly ball foul. Back of third, going to go out of play, dropping harmlessly to the ground in foul territory. It's not high enough to permit either Kenny Keltner, the third baseman, nor Dale Mitchell, the left fielder, to get to. So the count on the batter is two balls, two strikes. Earl Torgerson, Braves first baseman, leading off. 
in the last half of the fourth inning. And there was a spectator that uh, reached out onto the playing field and grabbed that ball just as the Boston Braves ball boy was going to go out there to get it officially. Of course, the fans get quite a kick out of that. Two balls, two strikes. Earl Torgerson sent to the plate. Here's the pitch. Swung on. There's a fly ball. Hit out to left field. Dale Mitchell comes in a few uh, steps and makes the catch. And there's one away. Torgerson flies to Mitchell and left. And that brings to the plate Bob Elliott. Elliott had an infield hit in the second inning. Now the outfielders march around toward left. Naturally, they play Bob to pull. Bob Elliott. Joe Gordon, the second baseman, is just two strides to the right of second. He's ready to move directly in the back of the bag. Now the pitch, and it's low inside, ball one. Kenny Keltner is ready to cover anything hit down that third baseline. Lou Boudreaux is laying back comparatively deep. He plays the most shallow shortstop of anybody. And he's sort of half facing the third base hole. Now the pitch, and it's low, ball two. Curveball that broke over the plate, but too low, below the knees. And it's a two-nothing count on Bob Elliott. One down, last half of the fourth inning, one to nothing, favor the Cleveland Indians. Elliott hit a home run over the right field fence in Cleveland. Now the pitch is high outside, ball three. He hit it more to right center, and that's exactly where Larry Doby is playing. Doby's playing right field today, but he's over toward right center. He's got, uh, he's giving Bob Elliott a lot of room to hit into down the right field line. The three nothing pitch on its way. And it's in there for a call strike, and the count is three and one. Three balls, one strike. Freddie Fitzsimmons, coaching at first base for the Braves, hollers down to the plate, said, get yourself a good ball, Bob. Now Lemon's ready. Here's the delivery. Elliott swings and fouls it off behind the plate on the ground, strike two. And I'm telling you, he swung from way back on that one. He was leveling off of the fence. So you got a full count on Bob Elliott, three and two. Three balls, two strikes, one out, nobody on. Last half the fourth inning, Cleveland leading one to nothing. Sixth game of the World Series. Cleveland Indians needing just one victory to wrap it up. The Braves needing a victory to prolong it to the seventh game. With a count three and two, Joe Gordon has moved a step closer over towards second. Here's the pitch. Swung on, little roller hit down the third baseline, and he may be beaten now. He will be. Bob Elliott. Bob swung with all his might, but succeeded only in topping the pitch. It rolled slowly down the third baseline. Keltner was laying back deep at third, as we told you, so Lemon had to field it. He raced over, got his bare hand on the ball, but it spun off, and as he tried to pick it up, all in the same motion, he sort of half pushed it across the foul line a few feet. And Elliott easily beat it for an infield hit. That's the fourth hit for the Boston Braves. And three of them have been infield hits. All of them on uh, plays that uh, Bob Lemon was involved in. And now you've got uh, Marv Rickard, left-hand hitter. Up. Rickard swings and foul tips it. Strike one. Bob Lemon throws a sinker, which is difficult for a hitter to lift. And thus, they as he forces these hitters to hit that sinker, they're topping the pitch and making them roll on the ground. Sometimes when the, the batter gets ahead of the pitcher in the count, and the pitcher figures he can't get that sinker over, then he might give him something a little too fat, and they will hit it up in the air. Marv Rickard, left-hand hitter up, stretch by Lemon, the pitch. Rickard takes outside, ball one, one and one. It's a one-nothing ball game in favor of the Cleveland Indians. We're in the last half of the fourth inning at Braves Field. Bob Elliott's on first base, one out, and Marv Rickard, who flied to center in the second inning, the batter. Lemon all set. Here's his pitch, and it's outside. Ball two. Two balls, one strike. Billy Southworth coaching at third base, slapping his hands together, walking up and down. Freddie Fitzsimmons coaching at first, watching Eddie Robinson for Bob Elliott. Robinson out on the bag with Elliott, but just a step in behind him. Outfield for Marv Rickard. Step toward right, almost straight away. 
Lemon delivers. Rickard takes strike two call. It was a fastball. It came in there just below the shoulders. Rickard steps out of the batter's box for a moment. Now he's back in hitting position. Count on him two and two. Two balls, two strikes, one out. Lemon looks in to get the sign from Hegan. Ready now, takes a stretch. Elliott moves off first. Here's the pitch. Swung on. There's a long fly ball hit the left field. Dale Mitchell going back. He's going to get under it near the wall. Makes the catch. Elliott all the way down to second. Turns and races back to first. Dale Mitchell caught that ball not more than 8 to 10 feet away from the left field fence. More than uh, 335 feet away from home plate. Which is a pretty good drive for a left-hand hitter who hits to the opposite field. So there are two down. And Bill Salkel coming up. The Braves catcher grounded out to first baseman Eddie Robinson in the second inning. Left-hand batter. Bob Lemon proceeds to work on him. Elliott moves off first. Now the pitch is outside. Ball one. Kenny Keltner walks in a step or two at third, kicks the dirt, hollers something over to Bob Lemon. Lou Boudreau at short, looks around his outfielders, sees that they're set properly. Now he motions Thurman Tucker to come in a couple of steps. It's really wonderful to watch Lou in action in a ball game. He's busy with something every moment. Now the delivery. Adds a fastball high. Ball two. Lou is either giving signs to Jim Hegan, the catcher, or hollering something to the pitcher, or motioning his outfielders to move a step this way or that way or back or in. I looks around to see where Doby is and Tucker and everybody. Then he has to worry about his own position. Bob Lemon all set. He throws the pitch outside. Ball three. Three balls, no strikes. Bill Salkel, the batter. Kenny Keltner laying about 10, 12 feet off the third baseline. And about halfway back. Lou Boudreau is in halfway over near the bag. Now the pitch. And it's right in there for a call strike. Three and one. Activity in the Indians' bullpen. Steve Gromek and Eddie Kleiman. Two right-handers throwing. Joe Gordon very deep. Halfway between first and second. He's back on the outfield grass. Now the delivery. There goes Elliott. The pitch is taken outside. Ball four. Evidently they had the hit and run on. I don't think Elliott was trying to steal. They evidently had the hit and run on, and the pitch was way outside and was taken for ball four. And now Saul Kell has an equal number of bases on balls as Eddie Stanky. They both have uh, worked uh, Cleveland pitchers for five bases on balls during the course of the series. So Saul Kell is on first. Bob Elliott's on second. There are two down. And the batter is Mike McCormick, who grounded out to Kenny Kelton in the second inning. Mike has had uh, five base hits in the series. Outfield playing McCormick toward left, not too deep. Bob Lemon throws. McCormick takes strike call. Curveball. Got the outside corner just above the letters. Larry Doby is comparatively shallow in right field. McCormick's power is more to left center. Left or left center. Now the pitch is going on. He's right back through the middle. Here is Elliott on the third on the way to the plate. Here's a throw. Elliott tries to be safe. Mike McCormick drilled one sharply through the middle. Right out over second in the center. The ball cut right over the bag. Joe Gordon made a desperate attempt to get that ball, but couldn't quite get to it. And Mike, uh, Mike McCormick drives one through the middle for a single to score Elliott from second to tie up the ball game at one and one. Sending Salkel to second, and here's Eddie Stanky, a right-hand batter. The first pitch to him is outside for ball one. That's the second run batted in in the series for Mike McCormick. Thus, the Braves are battling back in their own wigwam on the banks of the Charles here in Boston, tying up Cleveland at one and one. Bob Lemon ready, throws. Stanky takes outside, ball two. Stanky drew a base on balls in the third inning. Incidentally, for those of you who are sticklers for statistics, I don't know why I use that expression for a radio announcer. 
Sticklers for statistics. That is the first earned run in the series off Bob Lemon. The run the Braves got off of him in the second game was not earned as he beat them then 4-1. Now the pitch to Stanky's inside. Ball three. Three balls, no strikes, two outs, two men on. Bill Saul Cal's on second. Mike McCormick on first. One run in, last the fourth inning, score tied one and one. Lou Boudreau is trying to sneak in behind Bill Salkel, and the crowd hollers, look out. The stretch by Lemon, the pitch, swung on, a bounder hit, foul down the third baseline, fielded by manager Billy Southworth. Billy looks at the ball and says something wrong with it and motions to the umpires, he's going to toss it out, and they say, okay, Bill. These Boston fans have come to respect manager Lou Boudreau's great pickoff play as he began to edge in behind Bill Salkel before the previous pitch, everybody in the stands started hollering, look out, look out. Of course, that isn't fair, is it? The Indians won't be able to work the play if the fans get in on this thing. Eddie Stanky up the plate. Three balls, one strike. Stretched by Bob Lemon. Lou easing in behind. There's the attempted pick off the throw, not in time. And let me tell you something. Lou Boudreau caught the ball and stepped toward the mound to return it to Bob Lemon. If he had stayed there and re-tagged, Saul Kelly had him out because Saul Kelly lost his balance. Lou just saw he didn't have him and took a step toward the mound to return the ball. Saul Kelly, for some reason, lost his balance and his footing. And if Lou had just stood there and tagged him again, he'd have had him. There's the attempt to pick off again the throw, and it hits Saul Kelly. And Joe Gordon, backing up, gets the ball. The ball, the ball hit Bill Saul. <laughs> the, the ball hit Bill. Well, Bill will have to eat dinner, stand up for about a week. Lou, Lou Boudreau never did get his glove on the ball, and uh, it was Joe Gordon who had to finally feel it as it was slowed up by Bill Salkel as the Indians again attempted to pick off. Three balls, one strike on Eddie Stanky. Salkel leads off second. Mike McCormick off first. The stretch by Bobby Lemon. Here's the pitch. Stanky takes high. Ball four. And that loads him up. Salkel moves over to third. Mike McCormick down to second. And Stanky takes over at first. Bill Boisel, the batter, with the bases jammed, two outs. Saul Kell on third, Mike McCormick on second, Stanky on first, one run in, score tied, 1-1 one, one last to fourth. The pitch in there for a call strike to Boisel. I think perhaps the most surprised individual in this ballpark in the event that Boisel would get a base hit would be Bill Boisel. Now the pitch. Boisel takes inside. Ball one. Bill likes to brag about his hitting prowess, but only in a jocular fashion. He says, shucks, I'm just paid to pitch, and that's all I try to do. But he says, I'm up there swinging, since you never know when I'm liable to get hold of one. Now the pitch is on its way. Fastball, it's high. Ball two, two and one. And Bobby Lemon is a little bit angry with himself. Lemon came off the mound and took the return throw from Hegan. And I think Jim Hegan a little bit... Uh, Angry with Bob, I mean to the extent that he fired that ball back at Lemon. Come on, Bob, get the ball over. Two balls, one strike, bases jammed, two outs. Lemon into the windup, and the pitch. Swung on and missed, strike two. Two to the count. Eddie Robinson came dashing over to first base to take a possible pickoff throw from Hegan. Eddie Stanky had pretty good lead off first, but Eddie got back in plenty of time. Brady Fitzsimmons watching Robinson for Stanky. So you've got a count of two balls, two strikes, two outs, bases jammed. Bob Lemon into the windup. Here's the pitch to Bill Boisel. Swung on, it's a ground ball out towards second. Gordon grabs it, up with it, almost booted it. Throws over to Robinson in time for the out. One run for the Boston Braves. One, two hits. No Cleveland errors. And three men left on for Boston. At the end of four innings of play, it is a 1-1 ball game. Cleveland, one run, four hits, no errors. The Braves, one run, five hits, no errors. With the Cleveland Indians having stranded four men and the Braves five men. 
You know, most men enjoy corking good scrap between top flight boxers. If you're one of them, tune in Gillette's Cavalcade of Sports for the major boxing event of the week every Friday night. Consult your daily newspaper for time and station. We pause 10 seconds for station identification. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. You'll hear Queen for a Day immediately following today's World Series game over WOR, New York. Going into the top half of the fifth inning. It's going to be Bob Lemon leading off for the Cleveland Indians, and then we'll go to the top of the order to pick up Dale Mitchell and Larry Doby. Incidentally, for your edification, Bob Feller has just gone down to the bullpen for the Cleveland Indians. He's not warming up, but he's down there to be ready. Bill Boisel pitching to Bob Lemon, who swings and lifts a high pop-up down toward first base, Earl Torgson under it in fair territory, and he makes the catch a foot inside the foul line and about 10 feet toward home plate from first base for out number one. Bob Lemon, who flied to left field in the second inning, pops out to Earl Torgerson on the first pitch, leading off in the top half of the fifth inning. Score tied 1-1. And now we go to the top of the order to pick up Dale Mitchell. Mitchell flied to center field in the first inning, double to left in the third. Left-hand hitter. Big Bill Boisel into that windup, comes in with an overhand fastball that's in there. Just above the knees for a call strike. Mitchell's a six foot one, 195 pounder, left hand hitter. Swings and lifts a high pop up foul off to the left of the plate. There's Bob Elliott racing over near the stands, gets under it, makes the catch. Dale Mitchell fouls out to Bob Elliott, who made a nice play as he raced all the way across the foul line to the edge of the Braves' dugout, which is a pretty good dash since there's a lot of room between the stands and the foul line here at Braves Field. Caught the ball just at the edge of the stands near the Braves' dugout. Now with two down, up to the plate steps Larry Doby. Single to left in the first inning, fly to left in the third. Left-hand batter. He looks at a fastball inside around the letters for ball one. The folks in Patterson, New Jersey, claim Larry Doby as their hometown boy. And we have indicated that many times. Here's a pitch low outside, ball two. We have also said that he resides in Norwood, Ohio. Or is it uh, Norwalk, Ohio? The uh, Cleveland Public Relations Director insists that he resides in Norwalk, Ohio, but we know for a fact that he does live in Patterson, New Jersey. Now there's a fastball low for ball three. Chances are he lives in Norwalk, Ohio, during the course of the summer when he's playing ball with Cleveland, but his main home is in Patterson, New Jersey. Now the 3 nothing pitch on its way to the left-hand batter. Larry Doby takes it, and it's high, ball four. Doby gets base on balls, which is the first walk issued by Boisel in this ball game, although he hit Lou Boudreaux in the small of the back with a pitch ball in the first inning. Speaking of Lou Boudreaux, here he is. Hit by a pitched ball, first time that he appeared at the plate. Lou doubled in the third to score Dale Mitchell, who had previously doubled for the first run of the ball game. We're tied up 1-1, top of the fifth. Larry Doby leads off first to stretch. The pitch has a pitch out. The runner's not going. No throw. Ball one. They thought Larry Doby might be stealing. Called for a pitch out, but Larry was not going down. Doby is terrific at bluffing a dash to second. He can really fool you on that. He might attempt to steal. You never can tell. We'll watch him for you. Torgerson holding the bag. Doby inches off. Takes a pretty big lead. The stretch. The pitch swung on by Boudreaux as a long fly ball hits the left field. Getting under it is Marv Rickert. He's waiting and he makes the catch. No runs, no hits, no errors. One left on. And at the end of four and a half innings, the score, Cleveland won, Braves won. Men, to enjoy the cleanest and most refreshing shaves you ever had, prepare your whiskers with Gillette shaving cream and ease them off with today's Gillette Blue Blade in your Gillette razor. Both Gillette Brushless and Gillette Lather remove moisture-resisting oil from your beard pronto. Every whisker gets a thorough soaking and softens up in a hurry. Another thing, both of these Gillette creams now contain K34. This amazing facial antiseptic destroys 85 to 99% of all dangerous bacteria on and beneath outer layers of the skin. 
So you wind up with a surgically clean face. Yes, your face is as clean as clean can be. Men, for extra shaving luxury, plus the cleanest face you ever had, use Gillette Shaving Cream, lather or brushless, a quarter. Only Gillette Shaving Cream contains K-34. Speaking about K-34, here's a fellow that looks sharp, feels sharp, and looks like he's ready to be mighty sharp. As he goes into the final four and a half innings of this ball game, barring extra innings, Jim Britt. Thank you, Mel. Good afternoon again, everyone. The leadoff batter for the Boston Braves will be right fielder Tommy Holmes, who has one hit in two trips, four hits in 23 trips in the series. It was he, you'll recall, who beat Bob Feller in the first game by driving in the winning run. The outfield is set just a little to the right of straightaway. Lemon winds up and fires one right over for a call strike, a fastball. As Mel has been telling you, Lemon's best pitch, his most effective pitch, has been a sinker ball, and that, no doubt, has set up the four double plays with which the Indians have backed him up during the series in his two outings. Here it comes. There's a drive that goes down the left field line. Mitchell is retreating over toward the line, and he takes it on the run for the first out. Not too well hit. It was a fly ball, nevertheless, which carried about 305 or 310 feet. So that chops Tommy Holmes down to one hit in three trips, and it brings up Alvin Dark, who twice has figured in double plays. Once he hit into one with a ground ball back to Lemon, and the other time, after beating out a bunt, he was doubled off first base in the second outfield double play of the series. Alvin has four hits and 22 trips. He stands straight away, up even with a plate, and the first pitch is low and outside. He's a right-hander. The outfield scarcely changes itself much between Holmes and Dark because the two of them are capable of hitting the ball to all three fields. Freddie Fitzsimmons coaching at first, Bill Southworth coaching at third, and the score, 1-1. Here it comes. There's a ground ball back to Lemon. He has plenty of time to throw him out. Mr. Lemon, you know, had nine chances in the first series game, just two shy of Nick Altrock's all-time World Series record. And in this game today, he has had three. He's had three assists and has just missed a couple more. Two men out as Dark returns to the mound and Earl Torgerson steps up. Torgerson made a bid for a Texas leaguer that might have set a scoring opportunity for the Braves in the first but it was turned into a Tucker to Robinson double play, doubling Dark off first. Then his last time at bat, he flied to left. He's a left-hander, the pitch, in the dirt, ball one. Everyone agrees that Jim Hegan has turned in a magnificent job of catching during this series. Yesterday's game, of course, took sort of a lusterless finish off the series as both teams unveiled a real display of power. Lemon delivers, there's a foul ball back over the top, and the count is one ball, one strike. The young man in the Cleveland batting order who seems to have the number of Bill Voisel is right fielder Larry Doby because Doby has walked once and solved Voisel's delivery twice successfully with base hits. Torgerson is the Braves' leading batter with six in 16. He had a mark of 429 until Lemon handcuffed him in his two opportunities at the plate today. The outfield plays Torgy deep he specializes in line drive home runs. The pitch, high and wide, and the count is two and one. Torgerson comes from Snohomish, Washington, where he has been nicknamed the second Earl of Snohomish. The first, of course, was the great Earl Averill. And Averill, incidentally, saw the game at Cleveland yesterday. Here's the pitch. There goes a little pop fly out towards center field. Boudreaux and Gordon on the run, and Gordon makes a nice running catch going away. Joe went back a second base to take it. And in the last half of the fifth inning, no runs, no hits, no errors, none left. That is the first inning in which Lemon has retired the Braves, one, two, three. So the totals, at the end of five innings of play of one of the hardest fought, low scoring duels of the series, Boston Braves, one run, five hits, no errors, six runners left. Cleveland, one run, four hits, no errors, five runners left. If you're interested in the scoring of the series so far, the Braves have outscored the Indians 15 to 14. Cleveland has come up with a total of 32 hits against 39 for the Braves. The Braves have made twice as many misplays, six to three. And in the matter of leaving runners stranded, the Braves have left 33 on base against Cleveland's 32. Probably no series of modern times has been more grudgingly contested with the exception of Lemon's four to one victory in yesterday's 11 to five slugfest. In the first half of the sixth inning, Joe Gordon, the great 
Cleveland second baseman will be the batter. He carried an average of 167 into the game, but it's dropped down to 150. Since his first time up, he flied to left, and then he fouled to third. He's a right-hander. Boisell pitches high and wide, ball one. Bill McKechnie is doing the coaching at third base for the Indians, and Mel Harder, as usual, is doing the coaching at first. Their combination is constant. The windup, the pitch, too close, a fastball, and the count is two and nothing. Center fielder Mike McCormick is positioned over in left center field. Tommy Holmes is about 100 feet inside the right field foul line in the direction of right center field. Right field is wide open. Here it comes. Strike called, fastball. The count, two balls, one strike. The weatherman has been good to us all through the series. It has, it has never been particularly sunny, but the weather has always been adequate. The pitch. There goes a long fly ball to left field, and that may be troublesome. Rickard is going back near the fence, and the ball is out of the lock for a home run, putting Cleveland in front, 2-1. to one. Joe Gordon hit a long, high fly ball that just cleared the fence to the left of the huge scoreboard. His first home run of the series, his fourth hit of the series, and it is now 2-1 to one as Billy Southworth rushes some relievers into action in the bullpen. Ken Keltner is the batter. He's a right-hander, and he lets the ball go by on the outside. Keltner got a hit his first time up in the series, and he has nothing in his last 18 trips. The outfield deep to the left. There goes a high pop fly back of third base. Bob Elliott is going back, calling for it in foul territory, and he takes it for the first out. So that's none and three for Keltner in this game. Once more, Bob Lemon and the Cleveland Indians are on top by a score of two to one. The first run of the game was scored by Cleveland in the third when Mitchell singled to left just inside the line, and then after Dolby had flied out, Boudreau bounced a double off Tommy Holmes' glove near the line in right field. But the Braves tied it up on Elliott's infield hit, a base on balls, and a single. Tucker is the batter. The first pitch is low outside, ball one. He bears a startling resemblance, facially, to Joey e. Brown, the motion picture comedian. He's playing center field today and has no hits in two trips in the series. The pitch, ball outside, a fastball, two and nothing. Two balls, no strikes. Ball three, three and oh. Three balls and no strikes. Joe Gordon's home run was his fourth in World Series competition. Here's the pitch. That one missed the inside corner, and it is the second base on balls given up by Boisel. Tucker goes to first base, and that will bring up tall, left-handed Eddie Robinson of Paris, Texas. Mr. Gordon, a little earlier in the series, collected his 24th hit in World Series competition, and his fourth home run has put Cleveland in front 2-1. to one. Robinson is hitless in two trips. Boisel delivers. Outside. Ball one. Boisel has suddenly lost his ability to catch the corners, and Red Barrett and Warren Spawn, the latter the hero of yesterday's game defensively, are warming up. The stretch, the pitch, inside, ball two, two and nothing. Eddie Stanky charges in from his second base position in an effort to settle down the big South Carolinian. Boisel turned his back on him for an instant, not knowing that Eddie was there. They make quite a picture, by the way. Stanky is very much shorter than Bill. He pats him affectionately on the back with his glove and then goes back to his position. Stanky occasionally, with a right-hander up, will play out on the grass about five or six feet to the right of second base. With a left-hander like Eddie Robinson, he's about 35 feet to the right of second. One man out in the sixth inning. Boisel working from a stretch. There goes the runner, and there's a drive to right field for a solid base hit. Tucker is all the way to third base as Holmes throws into Stanky. Runners on first and third, and Boisel is on the ropes. 